Hi there, my name's Bill Brewer. I'm the Susan Stebbing Professor of Philosophy at King's College in London. I've taught previously at Oxford, Cambridge and Warwick, and briefly also at Brown and Berkeley in the States. I work on philosophy of mind, metaphysics and epistemology. I've written two books on the metaphysics and epistemology of perception, with a th third book currently in draft on the objectivity of perception. The question I'd like to consider with you today is this. Do we perceive the physical world directly? The discussion will be broken into four sections. In the first section, I'll set out three options in response to my question. Before launching into that though, I should say that intuitively, the answer is a resounding yes. Pre-theoretically, that's to say, we think that it's elements of the physical world itself, rocks, plants, and animals, that are immediately before us in perception. Perceptual experience is having those very things directly before the mind. Now, Berkeley aims to endorse this intuition. He thinks that the physical world is what is immediately before the mind in perception. But he thinks that what's there, what's before the mind in perception, is only ever mind-dependent ideas that depend for their existence on our perception of them. Hence, he concludes that the physical world of rocks, plants and animals is some kind of construction out of mind dependent ideas. And this is the first option, idealism. Yes, we do perceive the physical world directly, but the physical world is a construction out of ideas. Now Locke accepts the same picture of perceptual experience as Berkeley. That's to say he thinks that perceptual experience is an immediate awareness only of mind dependent ideas. But he insists on the mind independence of the physical world itself. That's to say he thinks that the, mind, that the physical world exists and is as it is entirely independent of our perception of it. He concludes that we therefore only ever perceive the physical world indirectly when the ideas that we perceive directly are caused by suitably resembling physical things. And this is the second option indirect realism. No, we don't perceive the physical world directly. The third option will be my main focus. This is the view called direct realism. It contends that yes, we do perceive the physical world directly. And furthermore, this is mind independent as we think it is. So the direct realist accepts the Barclayan immediacy of our experience of the physical world in perception and the Lockean mind independence of that physical world. And it does so by rejecting their shared assumption that what we're aware of immediately in perception is only ever mind independent ideas. Accepting, as Locke and Barclay both do, the mind dependence of the direct objects of perception forces a choice between idealism and indirect realism, the first two options. The direct realist avoids this choice by denying their shared assumption. So on that view, perceptual experience is a direct presence before the mind of mind independent physical objects themselves and certain of their perceptible features, their shapes and colors, for example. It's those very things that constitute the way things are in experience for suitably placed perceivers. This, I take it, is the naive common sense view. So it's sometimes also called naive realism. For direct realism seems to be undermined by the famous arguments from illusion and hallucination. Both of these arguments start with a kind of perceptual error illusion and hallucination respectively, as you might expect. It's argued that in such cases, in cases of illusion and hallucination, we are not directly aware of mind independent physical objects. This is the base case of each argument. This result 
that we're not directly aware of mind-independent physical objects is then generalised to all perception by the spreading step of the arguments. Now, before I return to direct realism, it's worth pointing out that there is a response to these arguments that I will mention and leave to one side here, and I call it the content view. According to this way of thinking, perception is, like thought and belief, a kind of representation of the world that may be true or false. Illusion and, hallu illusion and hallucination, in this view, simply involve false representational content. Now, this view is not indirect realist exactly, for there are, on the content view, no direct objects of perception distinct from mind-independent physical things. Mind-independent physical things are the only objects of perception there are, when perceptual experience involves a suitably accurate representation of them, otherwise it has no objects. But the content view is not direct realist either, since the nature of experience on this view is not constituted by the presentation of mind-independent physical objects. It's constituted instead by the representational content that is independent of what's actually out there, since that's how the view accounts for illusion and hallucination as false representational content. The way things are for the subject in perception is in this sense independent of the mind-independent physical world. So our intuitive picture of perception as a direct confrontation with the mind-independent physical world itself is undermined. I want to suggest, in what remains, that direct realists who really do preserve this intuitive picture may also resist the arguments from illusion and hallucination. They can do so by challenging the base case in the argument from illusion and the spreading step in the argument from hallucination. In the third section, I'm going to consider the argument from illusion specifically. And let's think about the base case. In an illusion, something looks a way that it isn't. For example, a circular coin at an angle looks elliptical. Now, since something looks elliptical in that experience, it's argued, the direct object of the experience must be elliptical. It's therefore not the coin itself, which is circular, or indeed any other mind-independent physical object, for there might not be any other handy ellipses around. So it must be some kind of mind-dependent idea or image instead. And as I said, the direct realist can in this case respond immediately to the base case. For given the subject's point of view and the circumstances, the circular coin itself has visually relevant similarities with an ellipse. It projects onto a plane perpendicular to the line of sight as an ellipse would if presented head on. Thus, the circular coin, directly present before the mind, albeit at an angle, perfectly intelligibly looks elliptical. We don't need any mind-dependent idea or image to account for the nature of the experience. So the base case fails. In illusion, one is directly aware of the mind-independent physical thing itself, in spite of the fact that it intelligibly looks some ways that it's not. In the fourth section now, I turn to the argument from hallucination. So in a hallucination, it's as if there's a dagger, say, before me, but there's no relevant mind-independent physical object there at all. It's not that something looks a way that it's not. There is no such thing. So the direct object of experience cannot be a mind-independent physical object. There isn't one. Now, in this case, that sounds right. So it sounds as though the base case is secure. But let's now consider the spreading step. Here's how the argument goes. Any perceptual experience has an introspectively indistinguishable hallucination 
That's to say, for any perceptual experience, we can conceive of a hallucination which cannot be told apart from that experience by the subject simply reflecting on her experience. It's indistinguishable. Hence, it's argued, it must have the same nature, the perceptual case must have the same nature as that hallucination. But we've just argued that the hallucination can't be a case of a direct awareness of mind-independent physical objects. So nor can the perceptual case either. Its direct object cannot be a mind-independent physical object either. Now here the direct realist replies as follows. It doesn't follow in general from the fact that two things can't be told apart that they're identical in nature. Consider a lemon and a lemon-shaped bar of soap. They might seem, for all the world, to be exactly the same. It doesn't follow that they are, that the bar of soap is a lemon. They're quite distinct in nature, in spite of the fact that they can't be distinguished. The direct realist claims the same goes for experiences. It doesn't follow from the fact that two experiences, the perceptual experience and the hallucinatory one, can't be told apart, that they have the same nature. Genuine perceptions, according to the direct realist, are a direct awareness of mind-independent physical objects. Perfect hallucinations, on the other hand, are not. What they are is simply experiences that can't be introspectively distinguished from direct perceptions. They're purely negatively characterised as an experience indistinguishable by introspection from a specific kind of perception. So the spreading step in the argument from hallucination fails. The fact that hallucinations are not direct awareness of mind-independent physical objects has no implications for genuine perceptions, for the two kinds of experiences are quite distinct in nature in spite of the fact the subject can't tell them apart by introspection. Now, I think it's fair to admit that this purely negative account of hallucination has been the target of various objections, but direct realists simply hold the line. So I conclude that direct realism really does have resources to undermine the arguments from illusion and hallucination, and so to defend the intuitive idea that perceptual experience is a direct conscious confrontation with the mind-independent physical world itself. In answer to our question, we do perceive the physical world directly, and this is mind-independent as we think it is. <laughs>